A critical role of assessment in education encompasses various aspects that are essential for effective teaching and learning processes. I am Mari Bendi Berha at your service. We have here eight subtopics, and I will no longer discuss items stipulated in DepEd Order Number Eight, Series of 2015, since everyone has the access to it. It's our basis in rating the K to 12 learners, since besides we are we are already in the transition to Matatag curriculum. So instead, I will be taking up these subtopics such as principles of effective assessment, assessment methods and tools, feedback and assessment, data analysis and interpretation, assessment for learning, assessment literacy and professional development, challenges and ethical consideration on future directions in assessment. Before considering the main topics, may I lead you or yeah, lead you back to the definition of assessment, the importance of assessment in education, and the types of assessment such as formative, summative, diagnostic, diagnostic and evaluative. For the definition of assessment, for which we are already familiar, assessment is the process of evaluating or appraising someone or something to determine their qualities, characteristics, abilities, or performance. Its purpose can range from measuring learning outcomes in education, evaluating employees' performance, in a workplace setting, like what you are doing now, assessing the effectiveness of programs or interventions, to diagnosing and treating medical conditions for those who are practicing medicines or for those who are extending their services in keeping the good status or the health condition of people. And the ultimate of assessment is typically to make decisions, provide feedback, or guide improvement. Similar to our goal in education, we wish, we always want to improve the students while they are learning with us. For the importance of assessment in education, we have number one, measuring learning outcomes. Assessment helps educators gauge the extent to which students have achieved learning objectives and standards. By assessing student knowledge, skills, and understanding, educators can determine whether instruction goal, instructional goals have been met. The second importance is information informing educate instructional decisions. Assessments provide valuable feedback to both teachers and students. Teachers can identify areas of strength and weaknesses in students' learning and adjust their teaching strategies accordingly. Students receive feedback on their progress, allowing them to understand their strengths and areas needing improvement. The third one is promoting students' engagement. Well-designed assessments can motivate students to engage more deeply with their learning. When students understand how their performance will be evaluated, they are more likely to invest efforts in their studies and take ownership of their learning. The fourth 
importance of assessment and education is that to identify learning needs. Assessment helps identify students who may need additional support or enrichment by pinpointing areas of difficulty educators can tailor interventions to address individual student needs ensuring that all students have the opportunity to succeed the fifth one is guiding curriculum development assessment can inform decision about curriculum designs and implementation by analyzing assessment results at the classroom school or district level educators can identify identify trends strengths and areas for, for improvement in the curriculum like what we experience in offering or in joining the national learning camp through their reading assessment we could determine we were able to determine their strengths in reading and their areas needing improvement so that the curriculum the localized curriculum we implemented for our students will really fit to their needs the sixth one is promoting equity and fairness assessments can help ensure fairness and equity in education by providing objective measure of students performance when assessments are designed to be unbiased and aligned with learning objectives they can help mitigate the effects of systemic inequalities and provide all students with an equal opportunity to demonstrate their knowledge and skills and the last one is on accountability assessment data are often used for accountability purposes such as evaluating the effectiveness of schools teachers and educational programs by assessing students performance against established standards stakeholders can make informed decision about resource allocation policy development and education there are already based on experience there are already schools in nearby communities which were already recommended by ched to be closed since no one among the students passed in the board exam or in the national examinations even so there's no use for for such institution to continuously operate since the quality are already sacrificed next is the purpose of assessment we have identified for understanding student progress and learning identifying strengths and weaknesses informing instructional decisions whether to go on to stop or to get back to so that we could connect the students pre requisite skills required in the new concept or in the new topic next is guiding curriculum development and improvement we are already in the first major topic on the principles of effective assessment the first of it is validity does the assessment measure what it's intended to measure say for example if you will assess the students reading skills will you be letting them read a particular text next is reliability consistency and accuracy 
of assessment results. Say, for example, 1 plus 1 will always be 2. Or it can never be, or the sun always rises from the east. Even though you are in different places, you will go to different countries, sun will always rise from the east. So it's consistency and accuracy of facts and data. Next is fairness. Ensuring assessments are unbiased and inequitable for all or equitable for all students. Authenticity, relevance of assessment tasks to real world context. The learning of the students should always be anchored to what they really need. Next is transparency, clear communications and criteria of criteria and expectations. The second in line is the assessment methods and tools. First is the decision on various assessment methods, such as quizzes, tests, projects, presentations, portfolios, and observations. Of course, the type of assessment we should use will always be anchored on the competency of our lessons. The next one is technology-enhanced assessment tools and platforms like the one being used by PISA. Students should be aware, should be competent in using technology so that they could really provide the needed answer for each question. Next is considerations of selecting appropriate assessment method on learning objectives and students' needs. The third part is on feedback and assessment. Under this item, we have three components. Importance of timely and constructive feedback. Strategies for providing effective feedback that supports students' learning and peer and self-assessment techniques. Providing feedback or effective feedback is essential for supporting student learning and growth. Here are some strategies to consider. Number one, be specific and timely. Feedback should be given promptly after the student completes a task or assignment. It should be specific focusing on a particular aspect of the work rather than general comments. Next is fo focus on the task, not the person. Feedback should address the student's performance on the specific task or assignment rather than their inherent abilities or character. Highlight strengths and areas for improvement. Yes, we are no longer calling it as strengths and weakness, weaknesses, but rather strengths and areas for improvement. Acknowledge what the student did well to reinforce positive behaviors and boost confidence. Additionally, identify areas where the student can improve and provide guidance on how to do so. Set clear expectations. Ensure that the student understand the criteria by which they are being evaluated. Clearly communicate what constitutes success in a given task or assignment. The fifth one is use a balanced approach. Offer a balance of positive feedback and constructive criticism. This helps students understand what they are doing well and where they need to focus their efforts. Number six, provide actionable feedback. 
offer specific suggestions for improvement rather than vague critics. Students should know precisely what they can do to enhance their performance. Seven, encourage reflection. Encourage students to reflect on their work and the feedback provided. Ask questions that prompt them to think critically about their strengths and areas for growth. Eight, involve students in the feedback process. Yes, let them do the first, let, let them share the first comments before receiving feedback from others. Use a variety of feedback methods. Incorporate different types of feedback such as written comments, verbal discussions, peer evaluations, and rubrics. Different students may respond better to different forms of feedback. 10. Provide opportunities for revision. Allow students the opportunity to apply the feedback they receive by revising their work. This promotes learning from mistakes and continuous improvement. Next is ensure feedback is understandable. Use language and terminologies that the student can understand. Avoid overly technical jargon or complex language that may confuse or intimidate students. Build a positive feedback culture. Foster a classroom environment where feedback is viewed as a valuable tool for learning rather than as criticism. Encourage students to give feedback to their peers constructively. Yes, they are sharing feedback because they want somebody to improve, not just, not just to criticize anyone. By implementing these strategies, educators can provide feedback that effectively supports students' learning and development. Next is peer and self-assessment techniques, which are valuable tools for promoting students' engagement, fostering critical thinking skills, and encourage metacognitive reflection. Here are some effective techniques for both peer and self-assessment. Let us first consider peer assessment techniques. Number one, rubrics. We should provide students with clear rubrics outlining the criteria for assessment. Peer assessors can use these rubrics for, to evaluate their peers work systematically. Next is anonymous feedback. Encourage anonymity in peer assessment to minimize biases and promote honesty. Next is peer review groups. Divide students into small groups and assign each group member to review the work of their peers. This allow more focused feedback and encourage, encourages collaboration and discussion among students. Four, Gallery walks display students' work around the classroom and allow peers to circulate and provide feedback anonymously using sticky notes or feedback forms. Next, peer editing. Pair students together to edit and provide feedback on each other's draft or project. Provide clear guidelines, and examples of constructive feedback to guide the process. So this is one way of what we call mistake proofing in continuous improvement process. Next is peer assessment conferences. Arrange one-on-one -on -one conferences between students where they can discuss and provide feedback on each other's work. This promotes deeper understanding and allow, allows for personalized feedback. Seven, peer assessment training. 
provide students with training on how to give effective feedback and assess their peers' work. This can include modeling examples of constructive feedback and discussing the importance of fairness and objectivity. Next is self-assessment techniques. Next in line is self-assessment techniques. The first to do or the first tool is checklist. Provide students with checklist or self-assessment forms outlining the criteria for success in a particular task or assignment. Students can use these tools to evaluate their own work against the criteria provided. Second, reflection journals. Ask students to maintain reflection journals where they regularly reflect on their learning progress, strengths, weaknesses, and areas for improvement. Provide prompts or guiding questions to scaffold the reflection process. The third one is goal setting. Encourage students to set specific achievable goals for their learning based on self-assessment. Regularly revisit these goals and encourage students to reflect on their progress towards achieving them. The fourth one is portfolio assessments. You know, it's the collection of students' best output. So, the student should really decide on what to include in their portfolio. Have students compile portfolios of their own of their work over time, accompanied by self-assessments, reflecting on the strengths and areas for growth evident in their work. Next, number five is think aloud. Encourage students to engage in think alouds while com <coughs> completing the task or assignments, articulating their thought processes, and self-assessing their understanding and performance as they work. Peer calibration, Socratic questioning. The fourth topic we have is on data analysis and interpretation. We have three items, techniques for analyzing assessment data to gain insights into students' performance and progress. Sabi nga, Ang kwento, may kwenta. Of course, based on the assessment result. We are giving feedback, we are analyzing it. Use assessment data to identify trends, patterns, and areas for improvement. Yes, we are providing feedback for the students to improve from their past performance. Not comparing their performance to other performance. The third one is making data-driven decisions to enhance teaching and learning outcomes. <clears throat> mm -mm. That's really true. If, based on the assessment, students cannot correctly answer them or majority of the students cannot respond or not give you the, the correct answer, this means that we have to stop. We have to pause for a while and really dig out the real problem why majority of the students are not getting our lessons. This means that the students are not yet ready to learn the concepts we are teaching at hand. So, we need to identify that prerequisite skills. We should get back to that. We should consider in while I before teaching the new concept. The fifth topic is the assessment for learning. Incorporate formative assessment practices to support ongoing learning and development. Next is strategies for using assessment data to adjust instruction and provide targeted support to students. This is true 
during these years that students experienced learning gaps, a lot of learning gaps and learning losses. So we, I, we also identified that many of them or 60, even 60% 60 of our students, especially in Key Stage 1, for grades 1, 2, and 3, have difficulty in, in reading and even recognizing the alphabet. So before teaching, the competence stated in the K-12 really get back of teaching them how to read first before teaching the competences stipulated in the curriculum. Next item to consider is the assessment literacy and professional development. What is the importance of developing assessment literacy among educators? This means that educator should have the high level competence on assessment itself. So understanding the, the real sense of assessment from the planning, developing, and getting feedback, communicating the results, and everything about assessment. That's, that's the real meaning of assessment literacy. Next is opportunities for ongoing professional development in assessment practices. If some of our students, particularly that not <clears throat> all teachers we have are education graduates, wherein they really they should really be equipped with the competencies on how to develop test questions. So if we have companions like that, we need to capacitate them through lock sessions in service trainings so that everyone should be competent in on assessment particularly assessing the student's performance assessing the prior knowledge of our students and all next is collaboration and sharing of best practices among educators some can serve as demo teachers so that others can benchmark from them from their best practices. The seventh topic we have, challenges and ethical considerations. Addressing issues such as bias in assessment, standardized testing, and high stakes assessments. Ensuring assessments are culturally, culturally responsive and inclusive and maintaining integrity and ethical standards in assessment practices. For our future directions in assessment, we have emerging trends and innovation in assessment, such as competency-based assessment and digital budgeting, potential impact of advancements in technology on assessment practices, and considering the evolving needs of education and society and assessment approaches. Advancement in technology have the potential to significantly impact assessment practices across various domains, including education, professional development, hiring, and certification. Here are some potential impacts. Number one, personalization and adaptability. Technology enables the, criteria, the creation of adaptive assessment systems that adjust the difficulty and content of questions based on the learner's performance in real time. This personalized approach ensures that assessments accurately reflect individual skills and knowledge levels, leading to more accurate evaluations and targeted learning interventions. Number two is automation and efficiency. 
automated assessment tools such as machine learning, algorithm, and nat natural language processing can streamline the grading process for subjective assessments like essays and open-ended questions. This <coughs> saves educators time and allows for faster feedback, enhancing the overall efficiency of the assessment process. Next, number three, is the remote and online assessment. We don't need to see our professors, but rather we can take it at a distance. At a distance. Technology facilitates remote and online assessment, enabling learning learners to complete assessments from anywhere with internet access. This flexibility eliminates geographical constraints and allows for continuous assessment in blended or fully online learning environment. So there are some feedback that arise if universities will resume with their full face-to-face, -face, their enrollment might be affected because many of the students right now are used to the blended platform more on virtual virtual learning rather than to always see their professors in the classroom besides it's also economical on both parties on the school and on the students so they, they also need to consult their students if they are amenable to the conduct of the full face-to-face -face process. Number four, data analytics and insights. Advanced analytic tools can analyze large volumes of assessment data to identify patterns, trends, and areas for improvement at both individual and group levels. Educators and administrators can use these insights to tailor instruction curriculum and assessment strategies to better meet their learners' needs. It is also similar to the use of Google Forms. So <clears throat> there are graphical presentations of those responses provided while students are are answering the the responses are, are automatically recorded and graphed number five is authentic assessment technology supports the implementation of authentic assessment methods that simulate real world tasks and scenarios for example simulation software can assess practical skills in fields like healthcare, engineering, and aviation, providing learners with hands on experience in a controlled environment. Say, so for example, if you want to learn driving, you can use machines to enhance your driving skills. You already have those kinds of computers. Next is gamification and engagement, yes. We call it indebted as fun field learning. Gamified assessment platforms leverage game design elements to ensure learner engagement and motivation. By incorporating elements like points, badges, leatherboards, and interactive scenarios, these platforms make assessments more enjoyable immersive leading to increased participation and retention of knowledge <coughs> blockchain and credentialing blockchain technology can be used to securely store and verify assessment results and credentials reducing the risk of fraud and ensuring the integrity of certifications and qualifications learners have greater control over their digital records, allowing them to share and transfer credentials 
more easily across different platforms and institutions. Number eight, accessibility and inclusivity. Technology enables the development of accessible assessment tools that accommodate diverse learning needs and preferences. Features like screen readers, voice recognition, software, and alternative formats ensure the assessments are inclusive and equitable for learners, including those with disabilities. But overall, advancement in technology have the potential to revolutionize assessment practices, making them more accurate, efficient, personalized, and inclusive. However, it's essential to consider ethical implications such as privacy concerns, bias in algorithm decision making, and digital divide issues. To ensure that technology enhanced assessments benefits all learners equitably. Presenting to you is the Matatag agenda of the current the Fed Secretary. I like this because her focus is for the students to become the ready through offering re relevant curricula. You must be able to produce the ready, active, and responsive citizens. How shall we do that? Of course, we need to coordinate with, with TESDA specifically so that they can be submitted for TESDA assessment. By the way, it is not the sole responsibility of EPP, TLE, TVL teachers to help the students become the ready, but rather other, other teachers can as well help the students. Say, for example, for the English or language teachers, you can help students by improving their English proficiency and submit them for test assessment so that at the end or after graduation, they can already apply to become call center agents because they have that international license with them. For those who are handling, who are mathematics teachers, they can as well help our students. We will not consider the, the curriculum because we do not have that, but we can offer special curriculum, curriculum, curricula for them to become, to help the ABL teachers become job ready and it's most economical. We will not spend have or more equipment, costly equipment, but rather it will just take us the microphone and even we can borrow from the school to capacitate our students. And for those who are in MAPE, you can help students become job ready by capacitating them how to become effective employee for the become become effective in wellness massage. Yes, not all illness can be cured by drugs. Only the mother's magic touch. But others can also do that through wellness massage. They are already licensed and they can be they can acquire that international license to bring through wellness massage. And for those who are science and science teacher can also involve themselves there to become for the students to become job ready. And for the teachers handling mathematics subject, we can submit the our students for test assessment too to become for the students to become bookkeepers. In fact, we have only one institution who is who serves as assessment center. It's in Sipokot. So, malapit lang doon ang Pamplona. Sana lahat ng estudyante nyo, bago magtapos ang taong ito, ay magiging job ready. So, doon sa, sa karanasan namin, prior to, prior to the offering of the K-12, we explored the the potential of students to really become job ready. So yung nag-experiment kami sa San Fernando, 
yung yung 40 naging 32 na lang kasi yung iba medyo medyo hindi sold out din sa sa massages na papasukan ng mga anak nila pero yung 32 na yun nawala agad yun ano bang nangyari at nawala agad hindi naman nakakidla so they went abroad only one was left studying in one of our prestigious university alam niyo ba yung nangyari sa bata na siya yung nag-i-income na and besides giving allowance to their parents because most of his professors becomes his customer. So, since siya na yung nag-i-income, instead na hihingi siya ng baon, siya na yung nagpapadala. So, alternative source of income, na disente siya. Ano po? Sana lahat ng mga estudyante ng Pamplona National High School maging job ready bago magtapos ang school year 2023 2024. Okay ba yun? For my last slide, I wish to share you this quotation by William Butler Yeats. Education is not the filling of a pail, but the lighting of a fire. So enjoy working hard, teach, and help our students to achieve their full potential too.